every second, a hundred billion neutrinos pass through the tip of your finger and every other square centimeter of your body, but you don't even notice. It doesn't matter if it's day or night, if you're inside or out, you are constantly getting bombarded by millions of billions of neutrinos. These tiny particles have no charge, almost no mass, and can pass all the way through the Earth without touching anything. It would almost seem as if they aren't even there. So how did scientists discover neutrinos? Welcome to the cool thing about science. I'm Matt Parker, and we're going to investigate not only how scientists discovered neutrinos, but how they even knew to look for them, and what they did when some went missing. The story begins in 1930 when theoretical physicist and pioneer of quantum mechanics Wolfgang Pauli proposed neutrinos to explain how beta decay obeys the laws of conservation. He thought during beta decay a neutrino would be emitted from a nucleus in addition to a beta particle, which is essentially an electron. Without the neutrino, energy and momentum would not be conserved, hence breaking the laws of physics. Italian physicist Enrico Fermi furthered the theory of beta decay by saying a neutron decays into a proton, electron, and electron neutrino. Knowing this equation and how often beta decay occurs, one can determine the neutrino flux, which is the number of neutrinos passing through an area per second. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. But still, how do you detect something that has no electric charge, essentially no mass, and almost never interacts with matter. Well, it turns out neutrinos will, on the rarest of occasions, collide with other subatomic particles. And when this happens, they may just be detectable. It wasn't until 1956 that the first detection of neutrinos was confirmed. Clyde Cohen, Frederick Raines, and a few others performed the cohen raines neutrino experiment in which they used a nuclear reactor to produce large numbers of antineutrinos. To detect antineutrinos, these particles would have to interact with protons somewhere inside two giant tanks of water. This interaction would produce neutrons and positrons. The positrons would then have to collide with electrons and annihilate one another and in the process two gamma rays would be released. The neutron would be captured by a nucleus which again would also release a gamma ray. Around the two tanks of water would be tanks of liquid scintillator which is a material that produces flashes of light when gamma rays interact with it. These flashes of light could then be detected by photomultiplier tubes alerting the scientists to the fact that antineutrinos had been there. And if antineutrinos exist it stands to reason neutrinos also exist. But our story doesn't end there. Now you see, this is where it gets interesting. Because in the 1960s, an experiment was performed to determine the number of neutrinos emitted by nuclear fusion occurring in the sun. Unlike photons, which can take thousands of years to travel from the center of the sun to its surface, neutrinos travel unimpeded from the sun's core to Earth in approximately eight minutes. The experiment used a 380 cubic meter tank of perchloroethylene placed deep underground in a gold mine as the target for the neutrinos. It had to be placed deep underground to prevent interference with cosmic rays. Perchloroethylene was used because it contains chlorine 37, which transforms into argon 37 as neutrinos interact with it. This argon was then extracted and counted, and from it the number of neutrinos was determined. But this is where things get weird, because they only detected about a third of the number of neutrinos they expected from calculations involving the standard solar model, which is the model that explains how our sun works. This difference became known as the solar neutrino problem. For close to 30 years, this mystery of the missing neutrinos was investigated, and no error could be found in either the experiment or the solar model. So maybe there's something more to the neutrinos. It was already known at this point that there was more than one flavor of neutrino. We've been focusing on electron neutrinos, but muon neutrinos had already been detected, 
and there is good reason to believe tau neutrinos also exist. But how would these other types of neutrinos that have nothing to do with the nuclear reactions taking place in the sun have any effect on the number of electron neutrinos being detected? Well, some scientists hypothesize that maybe these neutrinos could oscillate between flavors during their journey to Earth, and by the time they reached Earth, some may not be detectable by the experiments. In other words, maybe the electron neutrinos were changing into muon and tau neutrinos. This is known as the mikhaev smirnov wolfenstein effect, and it's caused by interactions of neutrinos with electrons as they make their way through the sun. The experiments that had been set up thus far were only sensitive to electron neutrinos, therefore new experiments would need to be devised in order to test this hypothesis. The first confirmation came in 1998 when the Neutrino Observatory in Japan, called Super Kamioka, performed an experiment to study atmospheric neutrinos, which are electron and muon neutrinos produced when high energy cosmic rays collide with the atmosphere. As the muon neutrinos pass through huge tanks of pure water, they would scatter electrons at speeds greater than the speed of light in water. This process produces ghostly rings of blue light called Cherenkov light that can be detected by photomultiplier tubes. This setup was also able to identify the direction the neutrinos were traveling. And by comparing the number of neutrinos traveling upward that had passed all the way through the Earth to those traveling downward, it was shown that far less were being detected traveling upward. This implies the initial muon neutrinos were changing into another undetectable type, and hence confirming the hypothesis that neutrinos do in fact oscillate between flavors. Mystery solved. So now you know not only how scientists discovered neutrinos, but how the mystery of the missing neutrinos led to the revelation that these tiny particles can actually change from one flavor to another. Isn't science so delicious? You see, that's the cool thing about science. It may have taken several decades thousands of scientists and millions of head scratches, but in the end it led to an incredibly intricate and complex discovery that Wolfgang Pauli never foresaw when he first proposed the idea of neutrinos so long ago. So stay curious, keep asking questions, and continue exploring the world around you, because science is all about solving the mysteries of our universe, and we need more people like you involved. Thanks for watching. Thank you.